One of the things I think has sort of really prepared me for working in the energy sector is, is the fact that a lack of energy did have a material sort of daily impact on my life. When I was, I was born in India and I grew up in a rural area in India for part of my childhood and I would remember there would be several days uh, could, could pass without um, you know, a regular power supply. So when I moved from India to the UK and then power is available 24-7 on demand, it really sort of struck a chord with me and it, it just by you know, sheer coincidence later, later on when I started my legal career and I had the opportunity to work in Africa and particularly focusing on um, the energy sector, uh, many of the things that you know, I grew up with experiencing were things that people were still experiencing here and, and I really do appreciate the importance of power. Um, I've also you know, spent time living in uh, an emerging economy, one that has grown significantly and you know, many African countries are in a similar state. They have so much potential, so much human capital. Uh, and uh, I, you know, if I, even if I play a small part in helping to uh, develop the power sector here, it's something that has always really motivated me. Three aspects to any power supply and the first first thing is there enough power being generated within the country that's the first question and and it's the most obvious question but sometimes less uh, um, spoken about but equally important it's how do you get that power once it's generated to the people in cities or in rural areas in cities they generally have grids they generally have um, they, it, it may not be perfect, but most houses are connected to the national grid. So then it becomes, is there enough power to supply those people? When you get outside of the big cities and go to more rural areas, then you may not have those grids. So then it becomes a question of how do you get power to those people? Um, do you build further transmission infrastructure? Do you build further distribution infrastructure? Or do you decide that actually we want to focus on small-scale rural electrification and have small-scale solar plants or uh, just on rooftops and villages? Um, there, uh, so there are a number of different ways of doing this. There's no single solution. I think you have to approach it from providing power and um, getting that power to major urban centers and also finding a way to get power to people in more rural economies. really a question I think of ensuring that uh, the business environment, the legal environment within their countries are stable, uh, recognizing the rule of law and um, I mean those are the key ingredients for promoting that international investment because there are always people willing and private equity firms in particular willing to invest in well-structured projects where there's certainty and stability. Um, Part of achieving that certainty and stability is for um, governments to work with uh, international development finance institutions or multilaterals such as the World Bank. If you have the World Bank supporting a project uh, and some of its, uh, uh, some of its uh, sort of affiliates such as MEGA and IDA uh, providing credit support and political risk insurance, that greatly enhances the attractiveness of a project and will massively increase the pool of international capital and international investors that are willing to invest in that project. Azura was a success, delivered on schedule, delivered on time and mm -hmm. project. Yes. What were the success factors of Azura and how can it be replicated? You had the World Bank um, that was supporting that project through uh, both the, its credit support from IDA and also from political risk insurance through MEGA. You had a government that was very strongly uh, um, supportive of the project politically as well. And the key, one of the key things the government did was issue uh, a put and call option agreement, which is essentially the government standing behind the project. Um, if everything went wrong and the project should be terminated, I mean, nobody wants that to happen. But investors and lenders need to know that the government is standing behind the project in those circumstances. So you had political support, you had government willing to 
um, provide uh, support through the put and call option agreement. You had a tariff that was um, reflective of the cost of generation, so it was a profitable and ultimately you had the international lending community that very much wanted to see this major project succeed and supported that project. It took a number of years to, to close, as, as you know, um, but uh, I, it, it has been very successful. There is certainly a space for gas. I mean, gas is, uh, let, let's not forget that, gas is base load, okay, it's constant power. Solar is not constant power. It's only available during the day. You can maybe extend its availability if you add battery technology. But ultimately, you want a combination of base load and um, solar renewable energy. Let's not forget there are hydropower assets in the north, which are also generating power. Let's not forget that Nigeria, as well as uh, being carbon rich, has coal reserves, which can also be uh, utilized and, and exploited. And there is plenty of clean coal technology. People say, well, why should we be considering coal? Isn't it really dirty? There is clean technology and, you know, what's the alternative? There are millions of people in Nigeria now who rely on diesel generators for their power, which is not ideal from an economic or environmental standpoint. So I strongly believe that there is a space for all of those technologies in fulfilling the uh, power. Gap.